I do want to use this opportunity to share the gospel with you because I believe it's my calling to preach Christ and Him crucified to you and throughout the rest of this world. But we're going to answer a question tonight, a very important question that a lot of believers wrestle with, a very important question that even sincere, true believers are divided over. And I, I mean, when I tell you what the question is, you're going to be like, how could believers be divided over that? Well, they are. But we're going to find out what the answer is through Scripture. And uh, the question is, can Christians lose their salvation? The simple answer is no. Okay, that's pretty simple. But we're going to see through the Scriptures why the answer is no. And it's not about, you know, what Southern Baptists believe. It's not about who's saying what. It's not about opinions. It's about what God says. It's, it's that simple. It's about what God says. It's about truth. And like I said, there's some truly sincere believers that believe you can simply fall away from the faith or that you can walk away from your salvation. The view that I hold, the view that I believe that Scripture teaches is that salvation begins at the moment of your conversion and continues throughout all eternity. And that's what we also as Southern Baptists believe that uh, the Bible teaches. Some say Christians can lose their salvation and they must be born again and again. Now we need to ask ourselves, do we really know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? We're going to see how that comes up here in a few minutes. We shouldn't be afraid to ask the hard questions and get the right answers. The Scripture teaches that salvation begins at the moment of conversion, when you trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you accept His gift of salvation, and it continues throughout all eternity. And what a great promise that is. I hope that through this Bible study tonight that you see how much comfort and assurance that the security of your salvation gives you. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because we're secure in Christ throughout all eternity that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit as we're going to see uh, that the Scriptures teaches us that we can do whatever we want to. Romans 6, 1 said, Paul asked the Romans, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul said, God forbid. <coughs> but let's first answer this question. Because we have to start from square one. What is salvation anyway? It's a real churchy term that we use, but what is it really? Perspective at salvation. In the Old Testament, salvation sometimes refers to other things. Like in Jeremiah 15, 20, it says, And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. So in this passage of the Scripture, salvation refers to the, the, excuse me, to the deliverance from danger. And you see that throughout the Psalms. Look how much David cried out to God. He was a man after God's own heart, and he had a lot of danger in his life. But in Psalm 39, excuse me, 35, verse 9 through 10, it says, Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in His salvation. And my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like You, delivering, there's that word deliver, the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. So this passage of Scripture in the Old Testament refers to the deliverance of the weak from the oppressors. Just like in Jeremiah where it talked about the deliverance from danger. Salvation, however, in the Scripture, it finds its deepest meaning when it talks about the spiritual realm of life. What I mean by that is one of the most clearest messages throughout the whole Bible is mankind's universal need for salvation from the deliverance from the power of sin. And salvation that comes through Christ... Now, I do not want you to get confused, but this is a biblical teaching we have to understand. And it can give you a lot of confidence and faith. The salvation that comes through Christ can be understood in three tenses. What I mean by tenses is past, present, and future. Let me explain what I mean, though. It means we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Let me explain that a little bit more. When a person believes in Christ, he is saved. And let me read you Acts 16, 30. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's the most important question we can ever ask ourselves. What must I do to be saved? That's the most important question that was ever asked in the book of Scripture. Scripture, what must I do to be saved? But what does it mean to believe in Christ? It's not just knowledge. It's not just knowledge because I know you know that verse of Scripture in James that the devil knows about Jesus and trembles. And it's not just agreement that this knowledge we have is true because Satan knows that Jesus is Lord. Satan knows <laughs> that his skin was cooked on the cross. Okay, He knows that Jesus is Lord. So what does it mean to believe in Christ? It means to trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. To trust in Him alone for salvation. Titus 3, 5, as we're going to see tonight, says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy has He saved us. Trust, trust though, it's a word with a few different meanings in it today. You know, it's kind of tacked up with, on pretty decor decorations and stuff over your toilet seat and stuff like that, you know. Trust is kind of misused a little bit. You know, I might trust that the weather is going to change because we're in September now, we're about to be in October. You know, I trust that the leaves are going to be falling off the ground. I trust that Dakota's not going to tell anybody that I still sleep with stuffed animals at night. Well, I guess that's not a secret anymore. <laughs> but uh, you guys are going to start laughing at my jokes. It's not even right. All right, how about this one? You need an ark built? I know a guy. All right, whatever. Uh, you only laugh when I make fun of you. I don't understand that. But uh, apart from that, when we trust in Christ, what that is, is we're placing our faith in Him. We're placing our faith in Him. We are completely depending and relying upon Him for eternal life. Trusting that what He did on the cross was final. I mean, first I said we are saved, and that's what we've just been talking about. When we trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we believe in Christ, that's what it means to believe in Christ. I want you to understand that. Because John 3.16 says, He who believes has eternal life. And it says it all throughout the Bible. And it's not just knowledge and it's not just agreement. We must trust in Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Trust in Him. That what He did at the cross was final and complete. That's what the Bible means when it says, Believe and you shall have eternal life. So first we talked about we are saved. Now second, let's talk about we are being saved. What this is, is it's the process of being saved from the power of sin every day. You and I as Christians are commanded through Scripture to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit to help us overcome the power of sin. What does 1 John say? Greater is He that is in you than he that is in this world. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, God promises that He's going to place His Holy Spirit within you. Romans uh, 8, I believe it is, it talks about life in the Spirit. And it says the same Spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that lives within you. And we've got to realize that we're very weak. Jesus said the flesh is weak, but the Spirit is willing. We have to realize every day that we're very weak, that we can't be obedient to God out of our own human effort. We have to be obedient to God and pursue our goals and pursue God's will through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's, it's that simple. It's actually it's called sanctification. Becoming more and more like Christ every single day. Romans 8, 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Also in verse 8 of chapter 8 in Romans it says, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But finally, this last part, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. Titus chapter 2, verse 12 through 13 puts it pretty good. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now listen to this. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we'll be rescued one of these days from this old world, from the troubles, from the burdens of this world, to be ever-present with God in heaven, eternally praising Him. And so we are saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. We're saved when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're being saved from the very uh, power of sin each and every day. And one of these days, one of these great glorious days, and it's coming soon if you look around you, we will be saved from the very presence of sin itself and all evil. So, 
With that being said, let's cut the cheese. I mean, cut to the chase. With all this, uh, I'm not even going to try anymore. With all this being said, knowing that we are saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved, how is our salvation secure? Well, we're going to examine that. This is a, a, a frequently quoted passage of Scripture when Jesus talks about His sheep. And it's in John 10, verse 27. And we'll get to that verse in Romans I had you all turned to earlier. And it's verse 27. Jesus says, My sheep... He's talking about the church. Not church building, but church the body of Christ. All of believers. Whether it's a congregation or a really small one. It's the church. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. No one will snatch them out of my hand, he says. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. What a precious promise of Scripture. That regardless of how far we get, and you may not feel saved because salvation is not based on feelings. As Brother John says, I can, I, you know, I can relate. There's many times in my life I have not felt saved at all. Like, how could I do that? Or how could I get down this low? But there's something so amazing about the Lord Jesus Christ that He picks us up right where we are. No matter if we're 10,000 miles away from Him, if you know what I'm saying. I'm speak, speaking figuratively. Or if we're as close to Him as the pastor. When we embrace the Savior who died in our place, that's when eternal life begins. Think about it. Can physical birth be undone? No, that's impossible. Physical birth cannot be undone. It's happened. And it's a done thing. And Jesus talks about that with this big, high and mighty religious ruler, Nicodemus, in John chapter 3. And he comes up to him during the night, so no, I know the other Pharisees have to you know, see him and stuff, and he doesn't lose his position as a big religious leader. But since he comes to Jesus by night and he's talking with him, he's like, truly you're from God, Jesus. And you know, they're talking about how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. You know that passage of Scripture. Our favorite verse, John 3.16, comes from John chapter 3. But he says, you must be born again, Nicodemus. And of course, we know how the rest of it goes. Nicodemus is like, what? How can a man enter back into his mother's womb? <coughs> Jesus is like, come on, man. That's not what I'm talking about. But physical birth cannot be undone. Neither can spiritual birth. Why would it? Understand. If salvation could be lost, then it would be dependent upon us. We would have to do something to keep it up. But see, Titus 3.5, let me read it to you. It's a pretty common passage of Scripture. Titus 3.5, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. If it could be lost, then we would have to do something to keep it maintained. But you have to understand, it's not up to us, it's... It's dependent completely upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's up to you whether you want to receive it or not. But you're depending completely upon Jesus Christ for your salvation. If it was something that could be lost, then it would be our duty to keep it maintained. Knowing that your salvation is secure. That you are secure until the day of Christ Jesus to live eternally with Him and to praise Him forever. Knowing that, it should give you great comfort. It should give you great assurance. It should give you great confidence and great faith in the God who created you and saved you for His glory. Also, secondly, knowing that salvation is a secure thing and that it's a, an amazing thing and that uh, Hebrews says that it's a so great salvation, why aren't we sharing it? It's the great name of Christ on your lips. Knowing that salvation is completely secure why haven't you received it? For those of you that might not have, what are you waiting for? What is there to wait for? Knowing that salvation is so secure and that it can give you so much confidence and faith and more importantly, eternal life. 